Thanks for joining us for this Beneath the Bible video. We know the Bible can be hard to understand and complicated to sort out all the different uh, issues and questions that you may have as you're reading it for yourself and trying to interpret it. So what we're wanting to do in this series is just to provide some background information, some context, and some helpful resources for you to interpret the Bible. So here's what we want you to know before you read. The book of Habakkuk is stated as an oracle which Habakkuk the prophet saw. The book consists of an oracle in the first two chapters and a psalm in the third chapter. The first two chapters are structured as a complaint by Habakkuk, which is both individually felt as well as on behalf of the community, and then there is a divine response. He shows a complaint about the lack of justice to which God responds, he will bring the Chaldeans to punish those who do injustice in Judah. But Habakkuk responds by asking why more evil people than Judah would be allowed to punish Judah for their injustice. And God responds that the Chaldeans too will be punished for their injustice. The final chapter is a psalm which includes a theophanic hymn. This section, even though it's at the end of the book, may be somewhat older than the rest of Habakkuk. He includes it here with his personal response in the final three verses. We have a whole video on chapter 3 that you can check out here. The book is introduced as the oracle which Habakkuk the prophet saw. Now, this is all we know about the prophet named Habakkuk. We're not given any family connections or even his place of origin. The introduction of this book is odd for pre-exilic prophets, or those who worked prior to the Babylonian exile. No other prophets are introduced this way in their work, so Habakkuk is again unique in this sense. In extra-canonical Second Temple literature like Bell and the Dragon and Lives of the Prophets, Habakkuk is described as the son of Joshua from the tribe of Levi. In the Lives of the Prophets, he is from the tribe of Simeon. In Bell and the Dragon, Habakkuk is miraculously taken from Judea to Babylon to feed Daniel while he's in the lion's den. Some scholars have suggested that the work seems to have liturgical purposes, especially the psalm at the end of the book, and have suggested Habakkuk was a temple prophet. He may have even been a temple singer employed at the Jerusalem temple. 1 Chronicles 25.1 says that some prophesy, some prophesy with lyres, harps, and cymbals, which echoes the footnotes at the end of Habakkuk 3.19. This gives us a clue that some prophecies in ancient Israel operated in and around the temple. If there were stably appointed temple prophets, they likely would have answered questions worshippers had for God, which is what seems to be happening in Habakkuk. The fact the final chapter is set to music may support this theory. Now, with all that said, we don't have much concrete information about Habakkuk, just some logical inferences. Now, there's a fairly small window when this book was likely written. In the first chapter calls out the injustice of those in charge in Judah. Now, in Judah, the king Josiah reigned for about 30 years from 639 to 609. In the perspective of the historical book of the Bible, Josiah is the model of a good king, in part because he was a religious reformer. So it would be odd, though certainly not impossible, for Habakkuk to be calling out widespread injustice during the reign of Josiah, one of Judah's best kings. Josiah, however, was killed in 609 BC. The Chaldeans, who are being raised up by God in Habakkuk 1.5, begin to expand in earnest around 620 BC and were major power players by 605. They took Jerusalem by 597. This narrow range of dates between the death of Josiah and the fall of Jerusalem indicates that Habakkuk prophesied sometime in the late 7th century with perhaps as narrow a window as between 609 and 597 for when it was initially written down. The setting of the book is much the same as when it was written. This was a tumultuous time not only in Judah but throughout the Near East. Ashurbanipal was the last great king of Assyria who ruled over the largest empire the world had seen to that point. When he died, presumably in 631, the Assyrian Empire entered its final period of decline. And this decline was partially instigated by the Chaldeans. Now, the Chaldeans were a West Semitic people who migrated into what is now southern Iraq, near the no northern end of the Persian Gulf. They were not ethnically Babylonian, but had established a sort of tradition of taking the throne of Babylon in times of crisis. It's important to know how symbolically important Babylon and being king of Babylon was. The Assyrians had kept the king of Babylon as a vassal position, in part because of how important it was. It was usually given to a loyal Babylonian, but later in the Assyrian Empire it was given to a loyal Assyrian. In 620 BC, a Chaldean chieftain, Nabopolassar, took the throne of Babylon and gained independence from Assyria. He did this in part through the support of allies in Elam, in what is now southwest Iran. Over the next eight years, the Babylonians under Nabopolassar, along with their expanding list of allies, including the Elamites, Medes, Scythians, and Cimmerians, waged war against the Assyrians. 
The fighting went back and forth for a time, but in 612, the Chaldeans and their allies destroyed Nineveh. The Assyrian forces were crumbling and they sought help from their allies in Egypt. The Egyptian pharaoh Necho II wanted to maintain a weak Assyrian power instead of having a strong Babylonian force, so he came to the aid of Assyria. This would have made it easier for, e for the Egyptians to pursue their own territorial ambitions, and during one of Necho's campaigns north to help the Assyrians, he was attacked by the Judahite king Josiah, who was killed in this who was killed in this battle at the site of Megiddo in 609. The Judahites made Shalom, Josiah's son, the next king, and he took the throne name Jehoahaz. However, Necho appointed Josiah's other son, Jehoiakim, as king and took Jehoahaz to Egypt as a prisoner. Jehoiakim re reversed many of his father's policies, and it's this period of upheaval and reversal that is perhaps the setting of Habakkuk. In 605, the Egyptians marched north to help the Assyrians at the Battle of Carchemish, where the final remnants of the Assyrian Empire faced off against the Babylonians and their allies. After this battle, all, the, all of Syria-Palestine fell to the Babylonians, and Jehoiakim had to swear allegiance to the Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar. Jehoiakim gave a massive tribute and Judahite nobles to Nebuchadnezzar as hostages to save the city of Jerusalem. However, he soon rebelled in 601 at the coaxing of the Egyptians, which provoked a response from the Babylonians. Now, this resulted in Jehoiakim being removed as king in 598, and another son of Josiah, Zedekiah, was made king. After nine years, Zedekiah was also coaxed into rebellion with the promise of Egyptian support, which resulted in a terrible attack and prolonged siege of Jerusalem. The Babylonians ultimately destroyed the city in 586. Zedekiah escaped to Jericho, where he was captured and blinded, and he, along with much of the population of Judah, were exiled to Babylon. Only a few decades later, in 539, the Babylonian Empire was itself destroyed when the Achaemenid Persian army under Cyrus took the city of Babylon. This is the context of the book of Habakkuk, a time of turmoil when nations were rising and falling and when nothing was settled. People were suffering, and the prophet inquired as to why God would allow it. Habakkuk does not provide definitive answers, but it may still be a resource for us in our own times of upheaval. Thanks for joining us for this Beneath the Bible video. If you like what you see, be sure to like and subscribe to our channel so you don't miss any upcoming videos. If you learned something new today, be sure to take a minute and share this video with your friends. And until next time, keep digging.